and we are live. Welcome back to the workshop. We have an extra special guest today. How are you today, sir, Mr. Forgeton? Um, busy but doing good. <laughs> good, 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 good. Are you the um still? Are you still a professor doing things like with that? Yep. Or yeah, <laughs> college uh, teaching a class yesterday on the Civil War. Nice. So okay. we um I brought you on and. Our, our kind of community here is into preparedness and also into home maintenance, all of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But I always, I like to pick people's brains to get you started. So for the few couple of people out there who don't necessarily know who you are, you know, where, where did you start? I always love to ask this. What was your first job in high school or before high school? <laughs> oh, and we have, uh, oh, sorry. There we are still. Did we lose you? Sorry, sir. We got. Now, my first uh, job. Oh, there we go. Sorry, it froze on. Just froze a little bit. Yeah, I, I went off for a second. Nope, that's yeah. okay. Uh, pump and gas. Pump, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pop and gas was my first job, and then four years, wonderful years, uh, greenskeeping on a golf nice. course. Nice. If I hadn't found a teaching job, I think I would have been a greenskeeper. I, I always do it. I try to do a bunch of research, and I saw that you were a hot walker. And when I saw that, I was like, "What in the heck is a hot walker?" <laughs> okay, a hot walker. Uh, I worked at a racetrack for a while. That's the guy who exercises the horses, uh, takes them out to the racetrack, catches the horse after the, the run, takes them in to get drug tested, then exercise them again. So it was a good job, you know, working on a racetrack. So a horses. racetrack in Jersey, that's... Um... Uh, no, uh, Liberty oh, Valley. Okay, okay, right on, right on. <laughs> so... I, uh, when I first reached out to you, I always, you know, I like kind of digging into hobbies and things too, but you're, you're obviously a civil war buff. I mean, mm -hmm. the, uh, the final year that, that, or the, sorry. Yeah. And your third book in the series was all about that <laughs> and you're big mm -hmm. into metal detecting. So what, what have you, what have you done with that over the years? Like I've always been kind of piqued my interest, but. Uh, I think my best experiences were in, uh, I've metal detected all around the world, working with archaeological groups. And Russia did some fabulous finds there, uh, only to have the KGB show up on the last day and arrest me. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I spent a little time in a Russian lockup. Um, that was, in you know, an adventure becomes an adventure after you've lived through it. Sure, yeah. At the time, that. you're scared crapless, all right? And, uh, you know, I got released, got back to the States, and then the State Department informed me I can never go to Russia again. But, wow. yeah, I've, I've had a lot of very good finds. I found a couple of uh, little, what are, are called happy men, uh, tribal seals from 1,200 years ago. Okay. Uh, um, gosh, all sorts of things. I, I don't metal detect as much right now because it's kind of hard on the back. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'll go to Civil War sites occasionally, pull up some mini balls, uh, you know, buttons, things like that. But and, uh, I was fanatical about it for a while. You, uh, we, we had a quick chat a little while ago and you got some, you got to go check some virgin Civil War land at one time, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the neatest experience, it was a small plot of land, about a fifth of an acre, that was smack in the middle of the second day battle at Gettysburg. Wow. But it was private land, and the state was buying, the government was buying the land, but it was still private. And we spent a couple of days working that, found dozens and dozens of mini balls and other things. Uh, a lot of them from Burdan's sharpshooters. So it was right in the middle of the second day's battle. I think that was the most fun I ever had on a Civil War site. And you, you mentioned Russia too, but it, um, you, you spent quite a bit of time in Mongolia. I was kind of curious how that ever came about. Just, it, yeah. I've been interested in Mongolian history since I was a kid. Okay. Um, I saw an old Russian movie called The Sword and the Dragon. Okay. Where the, bad, the bad guys were the Mongols. And I thought they were really cool. 
and went to the library the next day. Librarian helped me get a book. And I've had a lifelong love of Mongolian history. So it wasn't just uh, metal detecting. Uh, a lot of it was just exploring archaeological research. Those were four happy summers that I spent over there. Any any highlight or anything that just kind of anything you really enjoy? I'm sure it was all interesting, but I just I I didn't know a ton about Mongolia to be honest. I, I think I remember a morning. It was actually in the fall. It was snowing. I got up. Uh, one of my Mongol friends already saddled up a couple horses for me and a buddy. He said, "Go out while we're doing breakfast." And we went galloping across the steppe with the snow, you know, that old Mongol quote, you know, the wind in my hair. <laughs> and I had, I don't think I've ever felt so alive as I did at that moment. It was just, it was magical, you know, a galloping horse, the Mongolian steps. It was sublime. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. I, mm -hmm. I always love to, I don't know, memories are just something that connect us. You know, I, I enjoyed that. So, Okay, so my big area, of course, I'd love to pick your brain a bit about EMP, but we also kind of run a book club around here where we love to talk about post-apocalyptic fiction, kind of an mm -hmm. interesting combination. So I figured I'd kind of, I don't know, frame the questions through the book the best I could, but I wanted to ask you first uh, about Newt Gingrich, because he wrote the foreword for your book. How, I mean, one doesn't, I mean, I suppose one does just go up and introduce yourself, but how did you first meet Newt and where did that oh. come from? Newt and I have been friends for 30 years. Uh, a publisher introduced before he became, shall we say, Newt Gingrich. He was just another member of Congress. Sure. We just seemed to hit it off immediately. We're both history nerds. We've written eight or nine books together across the years. Uh, on the, Rev the the one I'm proudest of, there's two. There's uh, The Tri Men's Souls about it was a fiction novel about the Washington's crossing the Delaware. Okay. A lot of research, and I think it's a beautiful book. And another one we really enjoyed working on was an alternate history book called Gettysburg, where could Lee have won the Civil War? And in fact, we wound up doing three books on that. And, yes, sir. And I mean, we tromped battlefield. I mean, just to be able to tromp a battlefield with Nude and a General Scales was a good friend. And thinking about the possibilities of could this have worked or not, that that was a great thrill as a writer. So, new uh, one to segue maybe slightly to my more current work. It was Newt that encouraged me to write the book that would become One Second After, and uh, he helped me a lot with it. The, the book became a New York Times bestseller, and we're still friends today. You know, I just dropped him an email yesterday, uh, just about things in general. So uh, he's a remarkable man that few people know the real guy underneath the political propaganda that, you know, circles him. What's it like? I, I've had a few authors on now and a couple who have partnered, done, you know, co-authorships. What's that like? Because I know writing seems like a personal kind of experience. And if it's somebody who's a good friend or, you know, a really close personal friend, how, how does that work out for you? Well, there's an old saying that co-authoring a book is twice as much work for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's really good. I, I, I wouldn't say that about Newt. Newt was very much a contributing partner. Now, yeah, okay. I did 90% of the keyboard in front of me writing. Okay. But to have his political insights was a great help. And sure, it helped a lot. One, he really loved one second after and said, you know, let me promote this a little bit for you. So, yeah, yeah, it is. It's twice as much work for half the money, but I had a good time doing it. That's cool. Thank you. And during the uh, the foreword that he wrote for one second after, he, he kind of talked about some of your inspiration a lot. Or, well, sorry, I don't know mm -hmm. if he said it was your inspiration or he felt that they were spiritually inspired inspired but books like alas babylon and yeah. unfortunately 1984 which is great company but just you know seems to be more realism than anything so were those the ones or did you have others you read growing up or what did you, you know 
in my own forward to that book, I specifically acknowledge uh, Alas Babylon. I read that book when I was about 10 or 11 years old, freaked me out. Uh, yes. I've read it repeatedly. I, I would say that one second after is a 21st century update of, you know, Alas Babylon, um, in which we are caught off guard by what turns into a horrible kind of cataclysm. Absolutely. Yeah. Alas Babylon was, was a private, not a private, but just a, a pilot who, yeah. yeah, chased a train, right? And kind of. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, it's actually about, uh, I mean, a small community trying to survive after a nuclear war. Uh, when I first started writing uh, One Second After, I cast it in a fictional town. Now, it was my town, uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina, but I named it something or something. But then my college president uh, read it and he's like, why don't you call for what it is? It's the college where you work, Montreal College. It's the town you live in. And thus it was. So it's cast in a real place at a real time and also a reflection of the college I teach at. So, you know, it's funny. There's tourists come almost every day wanting to buy maps because we. a friend of mine puts out maps of the book and where things happen. Oh my. It's kind of funny, you know, I'll go downtown and somebody will look at me and go, aren't you the author? <laughs> I had no, I mean, I knew, I knew the book was big, but I didn't know it was quite the little cultural phenomenon. Like, that's yeah, really interesting. Copies. Yeah. So how many, I, I'm, I'm going to jump around. I, so most of the characters then, are they based, I always love asking this question, but are they based on people you know, for the most part? Yeah, very much so. Um Almost every character in that book is based, you know, because you create a character and in a way it's being created in a vacuum and inside the vacuum of your head. All right. But if I think, okay, I'm going to, for example, the pharmacist, we only see her really once, but I based her upon the pharmacist that I knew, a very attractive young lady who I had a bit of a crush on, but we were both <laughs> married. And I based it on her. Uh, more, for example, the character Maury Heard, that's actually his real name. Two characters, I kept their names. My neighbor, Lee Robinson, Maury Heard. Those are real people. Uh, but the people around me, or the people around my main characters, they're, they're all real. And in particular, the character of the college I work at. We're a small Christian college. We're not a Bible thumping college. We're just a Christian college, and we got darn good kids in there. You know, I was just saying yesterday, I was telling my girlfriend how, you know, it struck me again. I walk on campus in the morning, it's good morning, Doc. Kid pulls the door, how you doing, Doc? It's just, it's almost like a throwback, this college, to maybe America of some years ago, in which people were a heck of a lot more civil to each other than they are today. I uh, I did my four year undergrad at a uh, a two hundred and fifty person Bible college, so right. I I have I have a bit of an understanding. So that's really mm -hmm. cool. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And I know I know you use this exact illusion in the book, but you really do paint your town like a Norman Rockwell esque painting. <laughs> Is it a bit like that? <laughs> well, I think the opening paragraph um, I set it on a particular spot on what's no, it's Cherry Street in my town. It's got old shops and things like that. And I have my main character standing there looking around and goes, I'm going to damn Norman Rockwell painting, you know? Broke the fourth wall. It does feel like that. Um, it feels a bit like Mayberry. And then suddenly horrible things happen and how are they going to co cope with it? And yet not lose sight of who they are. I wanted to ask you one more quick question character question there before we slide on a little Washington he was my favorite or one of my favorites for sure was he based on anyone in particular you know, kind of the you know I the opening you know when they they do the first couple of executions the capital yeah. punishments and he's there talking John through and he's like you know first for the body then for the head he just seems like a guy that's seen a lot of world and 
when my main character throws up immediately after having done the shot and Washington says to him, I'd be worried about you if you didn't puke at this moment. Yes. I based him on more than a few vets that I knew, more of World War II vets who were close friends. But I really loved developing the character of Washington. Hated when he died at the end, but that was part of the plot. Uh, The classic good-hearted veteran who underneath still has the training if need be, but also knows how frightening and horrible the whole thing really is. Um, I, I used to do a lot of work with World War II veterans. You know, they come to my classes and such. I've been to Europe a couple of times with a D-Day vet, and he was always very mild mannered. But every once in a while, something would come up, and he would just sort of like freeze. And you could see that the thousand-yard stare was still there. You know, that this man was still haunted 50, 60 years later. So I based Washington on mostly vets that I knew. Okay. So with so John, when, when they have the opening scene, well, no, sorry, not the opening scene, but when he meets with the mayor in the town, they start getting things together. Mm-hmm. And he says something like, um, anyone with the remotest understanding of an EMP should have been going insane before this. <laughs> so yeah. how did you how did you even become cognizant of an EMP, the concept of an EMP? Where did oh, that come from? Question. Uh, when I was in graduate school, gosh, a long time ago. It's okay. Uh, I went to grad school late air 80s, early 90s, in my late 30s. And okay. I was a anomaly. I was an older grad student, but I can remember us talking about asymmetrical first strike weapons. Mm-hmm. That means it's outside, asymmetrical means it, it's it's an unknown new type of weapon system that catches the other guy off guard. And it was very frightening back then to realize you only need several uh, EMP-related nuclear warheads, which is simply taking a low-yield nuclear warhead, detonating at 250 miles above the Earth's atmosphere. It sets up a magnetic disturbance, cascades to Earth, and blows the electrical system out, and you're done. It's over with. And that's when i first became aware i played with it a bit a couple of times in a science fiction novel and it was actually yeah it actually was new i was thinking first you know aliens something like that and newt and i were talking about it. i said well, why don't you write about it in a real world sense and that was about 15 17 years ago he said that to me and that started me working on it uh it's a very frightening type of weapon you don't need the ground bursting weapons of the cold war you know blowing up entire cities right the emp again is triggered by setting off a low yield nuclear weapon about 250 miles above the earth's atmosphere where the atmosphere is thin enough that it starts setting up a chain reaction not like a train reaction with a bomb blowing just simply splitting off three atoms that cascades down at the speed of light and by the time it hits the earth, it sets up a massive electrical discharge. You don't see it, can't smell it. It's just suddenly all the lights go out. All the wiring starts melting off its poles. It's over. It's done with. You've it's won crazy. the war in the first second. And it's a little more, uh, not plausible deniability, but you, you're not you're not going to be held accountable for all the destruction of a nuclear bomb as someone who lets an EMP off, you're going to kind of let the country disintegrate around itself after it uh, falls apart. Yeah. Uh, Another inspiration for me, he passed away just last week and much lamented, Dr. Peter Pry. Peter Pry has been working this issue for 30 years. When I first started researching uh, on EMP, it was reports to the congressional committee that Peter Pry wrote that got me going. And finally, I'm in contact with him and meet him personally. And this is a guy who says, this is real. And then I'm checking with other people, including experts on fighting nuclear war. They're all saying the same thing. This is real. That's what got me going. And it's so incredibly deceptive. Those of us who grew up in the Cold War 
What's thinking about city busters, you know, 50 megaton warheads blowing out New York, Moscow, and everything else? No. The optimum is three weapons, eastern United States, mid-United States, western United States, lofted up by a rocket. North Korea can already do this. Pop them and then sit back. Peter Pry, and I agree with it, estimated 90% of all Americans would be dead in a year. Wow. 90% just because we turn the electricity off. And then prime for whoever happened to let it off to come in and inherit all the, the bread basket of America and all the prime farmland and whatever else you'd or, or just for the case of North Korea, for example, just a screw is over. Good point. You know, the, di the dictator finds out he's going to die of something, so he says, I'll take America with me. If Hitler had had that in 1945, he, excuse me. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, the Hitler had an EMP in 1945. He had used it. Not that he could win, but he definitely would have used it. People wonder, why 90%? Uh, well, let's right. go over this real quick. You, I call it like a Maslow hard hierarchy of needs. You remember that? Maslow's hierarchy, you need this and that. Well, Maslow's hierarchy of needs for an advanced technological civilization. First and foremost, besides oxygen, you're going to need water. If all, the whole electrical grid is down, the vast majority of people are out of water almost immediately. You know, the pumping, filtration systems. So within one to three days, there's already a water crisis. But within five to seven days, you're going to start getting disease crisis. People going to drink, you know, polluted water. The sewerage is pumping directly back into rivers. If it's still pumping at all, pollutes that. Number two, food. The average community has 20 to 25 days worth of food on hand. That's it. Yep. That's what's in your fridge, which is melting, in the supermarket, which is melting, in the trucks. Once that food is gone, it's gone. No more is going to be coming in. Medication. Medication now, you go into your pharmacy, and let's say you're on a controlled substance, all right? Uh, so you, you you put your order in, they fill it. The, 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 the pharmacy is in the old days where you had weeks and weeks of stuff on hand. It goes up into a computer, next day a refill comes. Well, suppose the refills don't come anymore. Within a couple of days, pharmacy is basically out. And for certain situations, that means within a week or two, people are going to be dying from that. People dying, uh, pain medication, cancer medications, heart medications. Then, of course, command and control. The bad guys are going to be coming out of the woodwork within a day or two, stealing what they can, killing who they can. All this leads to a societal collapse. I remember... I call you my gateway drug to prepper fiction. And I don't know if you even, I don't I'm, even know. I hate to do this, but I'm in the middle of writing a book. And when I write a book, I smoke. And then as you, soon as I've done writing a book, I'm done. Okay. You're, that's okay. That uh, that reminds me, uh, anyway, reminds me of Misery, Stephen King's Misery. But that's another oh, story. Oh, don't day. scare me. I know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but he always okay. had the one smoke at the end. You know? I, I, I've had it happen several times where... Uh, like I, I'm, I'm getting on a plane and the stewardess recognizes me and goes, I'm your number one fan. And I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, I like, can't help but have this reaction. Like, oh, really? Well, I'm oh, not really me. I'm something else. I just look like him. I get that a lot, you know? Yeah. So that you're, you're talking about everything falling down. So I remember reading it. I, I don't know. It's probably 2011, maybe the first time. And of course, the scene that stuck with me was the nursing home scene. And I'm sure that is, how do I, how do I, like, I hate to say it, but that seems pretty realistic. Where, where, what do you think? I mean, obviously you oh, wrote it. Yeah. There's a story behind this. Okay. When I was writing one second after my father, who was 88 at the time is slipping away and he's at a nursing home, uh, just a mile up the road from me. Uh, he was an old, he actually was a cavalry trooper pre World War II Army. He was a horseback trooper. All right. Wow. He's 88. He's dying. And a huge two hurricanes crossed over us within a couple of days and it blew out the infrastructure. 
Whites were gone, everything else. But I get a call from the nursing home and they're saying, we're so shorthanded, can you come up and help? You know, it was a relatively small nursing home. I'm on my way. I drive up there and number one, because everything is messed up at the moment, two thirds of the staff didn't show up. They couldn't, they couldn't get up the mountain. Wow. Because the mountain was closed. The staff that was still there, some of them had been there for a day, day and a half. They tell me we're out of water. And I'm like, don't you have a cistern? No, isn't that required? No. Okay, I go down to an emergency supply point to get water. That almost turns into a brawl in my hometown. People are like, because I pull up and I say, I need 50 gallons, you know, one gallon jugs. And people start saying, you're, you're a water hoarder. Why are you doing it? I said, it's for the nursing home. Finally, the chief of police has to intervene. He throws four, six gallon bucket, you know, crates, you know, in one gallon uh, milk container. He said, just get out of here. <laughs> I'm back at the nursing home. And they're on emergency lighting. And I comment, suppose the emergency lighting goes out, you know, because it was a generator. There's nothing we can do. Wow. And my father was at times requiring, uh, you know, a respirator. Mm -hmm. And they said, if that happens, we'll go to bottled air. But once we run out of that, we'll, you'd, you'd have to go to a face mask with a squeeze ball to keep pumping air into your father until it gets to the point that you're too tired. And I said, so then he dies. And uh, now I'm asking them questions. What about Alzheimer patients? You know, they wear, they wear anklets, you know, to, to securely lock the doors. But the emergency default is if they lose the doors automatically are open. Now with only three or four staff there rather than 10 or 12, the Alzheimer patients are just going to be wandering out into the dark. Wow. And I'm like, and I remember the head of the, the, the nursing, we sat there for a couple hours. We were good, but she was in tears when she said, My God, I have a three day supply of pain medication. What happens then? These people fighting at the end of their life on some, you know, heavy pain medication, it stops. Right. So that nursing home incident. I drew very much on the real life experience of helping at my father's nursing home and coming away from it badly shaken, you know, with the implications. The um, the veteran gentleman that you run across in there and you give them each a six pack of insure, I believe, yes. were they based on your father by chance or at least? No, they're a... based on one of my best friends. Okay. He was a D-Day vet, Andy Andrews. He's the gentleman I went to Europe twice with, to Omaha Beach, once for a magazine article, and then once just to see it all. And I, I don't know, I just pictured Andy sitting there in a wheelchair with his big one red hat on. Hmm. And he's reduced to asking someone, can I just, can you just give me a couple of hands of insure? Well, what's going to happen after he drinks those? And it's six hours later. He's going to start dying. Yep. I, I was, I was very badly shaken by that thought. I'm going to tell you a funny story to break the mood for one minute. Sure, you go right ahead. Andy, uh, we just had a major celebration of Andy's life. Uh, he would have been 99. He's, he's passed away. Okay. My favorite story about this D-Day vet. We're going to Omaha Beach for the first time for Boys Life magazine. We're doing a major article. And we're about to go up to the ticket counter. And I prep Andy on what he's supposed to do. At this point, he's like 85 years old. So we walk up to British Airways. He's wearing cap with Omaha Beach, big red one, all right, with this four purple hearts, bronze star <laughs> yeah. oh, emblems on his hat and so i um, start talking to uh the girl behind the counter and i say look uh is there any way we could maybe get upgrade just to emergency row seating so we have a little more leg room but i gotta keep an eye on my friend and at which point i kick him under the table and he just suddenly goes yeah yeah 
They're going back to Omaha Beach. See, see that right there, Omaha Beach. Big red one. Second day in, Kraut shot right across the face. Right, here. it did. Shot okay. See the car there? Oh man, I I got infected. Second time, Kraut got me right in the shoulder here, but I got him. And, and the woman's looking at him and goes, "Just a moment." She goes behind, you know, comes back out with the manager a minute later. Andy goes into it. Yeah, Kraut shot me right across the face, <laughs> right here. Second day in, and then another Kraut tossed a grenade at me, nailed me in the shoulder. And she's like, I'm upgrading both of you to round trip first class. Thanks for your service. <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> he knew. As soon as we got away from the counter, you know, he's, and then we were laughing our butts off. We got on the plane. They had already told him the stewardess are waiting on his hand and foot. That was a sweet moment, acknowledging this guy and the funny thing was the rest of the staff that was traveling with us photographer and all that they're still back in economy class <laughs> so I look over i go yeah keep rowing guys keep rowing <laughs> we got champagne here <laughs> it's so important to keep those memories alive i thank you for sharing that 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 bless <laughs> that, yes thank you i it's just yeah i always enjoy it when somebody shares a memory that's kind of personal right. Yeah, funny. It, 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 yeah, I enjoy it. So, okay. Where, when they had in, in the book, when they had their, their first meeting there that we spoke about, like with the town meet members, and I can't remember who said it. I want to say it was the mayor. She said something along the lines of, can't they just build a better shock or a surge protector? And so, where, where does that come in? Because why haven't we built a better surge protector? As far as why haven't we prepped for a okay, hit the delete button because I'm going to go into a Tourette syndrome moment here. <laughs> Sorry, if I you go right at you, hundred percent, you can say whatever you want here. That's not a problem. No, no, no. I teach at a Christian college. I'm not. I understand. We've known for 20, 25, 30 years. In fact, back all the way to the '60s, the first real recognition of the threat of EMP was a nuclear test in 1962 called Starfish Prime. We lofted a nuclear weapon out in space in 1962, blew it, and it shut off electrical systems 500 miles away in Hawaii. So we knew it. Wow. We're whistling in the dark. There have been two major congressional studies there's been innumerable smaller ones. There's been testimony all over the place. My friend, again, lamented, died last week, Dr. Pride, said that for $2 billion, we could start retrofitting some of the electrical grid. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm pessimistic whenever it comes to that type of funding. So let's say $30 billion. Sure. $30 billion. How much have we passed in spending bills in the last couple of months? with far less priority as to the effect. Sure. Twice, Congress did put EMP bills up. Both times it got shot down, in particular because of McCluskey from um, Alaska. Just before the end of the last administration, our president then mandated a 90-day study and then we report back from major agencies as to what needed to be done to protect from either a solar storm or EMP that was dropped the day of uh, the day of the inauguration. It was just simply dropped. We've done nothing. As in just the previous administration to the current, is that correct? Or did I? Yeah, just want to make sure I heard that right. Um, we're talking about trying to build a more robust electrical grid that can withstand an EMP. You're never going to get 100% assurance, but certain lines at least should be, you know, secured. Um, we're not doing it. We're simply not following through. I, I saw a, it's about five, six years ago at a conference where they demonstrated high power, and there's the key thing, the high power tension lines. Mm -hmm. They hit it with a large EMP. The wires were literally exploding and falling off the pylons. 
Oh you God. wipe out that grid, you've wiped out the grid. It's it's not sustainable. The study that really bothered me, uh, DOE, Department of Energy, did a study about four or five years back on electrical grid. The average component in America's electrical grid is 40 years old. We're basically running a 1970s system. Um, we have no, almost no hardening except on military sites. Uh, all those trans, okay, transformers. Let's talk about the large scale transformers. How long do you think it takes if a transformer goes bad? How long does it take to get the thing replaced? As in, order a new one and have it ship? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Some of the reading I've done, 18 to 24 months. Exactly. Where do the transformers come from? Unfortunately, China. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. They're going to help us. Yeah, right. Yeah, Sorry. okay. Okay. Well, we'll have a lot of transformers coming. I, I was passing one on the highway the other day, a mammoth thing on a wide load. And I'm thinking that was ordered at least two or three years ago. Now, I gave a talk a couple of months ago for a coalition of small energy providers in South Carolina, all right, independent uh, grid systems. And these guys were with me 100%. They were reinforcing what I said, and they were saying the same thing. We have no redundancy. We have no stockpile. We have nothing to build it back with, if we can ever build it back, versus having emergency supplies on hand. That will cost billions. But it's essentially the spare parts to rebuild a system. We don't have them. We're therefore, to put it in the most common the terminology, we're screwed. It, it's like the Saturn rocket I read one day. They said it's not just they couldn't rebuild it. The people with the skills to build it don't even exist anymore. Right. Wow. Well, we got a new one, the Artemis One SLS, but I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. <laughs> it only costs $93 billion and it still hasn't flown. <laughs> so what? So I, I'm sure things like your vintage World War II plane would survive. I, I'm guessing the plane was that a bit uh, of That's a nod. That's plane. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. So what? What? What do you think in? In the expertise you have, what do you think is going to survive an EMP? What do you think won't? And Not much. You know, the first thing that will happen, there's upwards of 4,000 commercial airline nerds crisscrossing oh. the country at any given moment. The vast majority of those will lose all their electronics. Even if you have Captain Sully in the front seat, when Captain Sully lost his engines from that bird strike, he still had hydraulics. It's hydraulics that when you pull that stick back, the hydraulics activates the elevator in the back to go up or down, all right, or left to right. All that's gone. So within the first three minutes, you're just going to see planes going down. Hundreds of thousands of people will die in the first couple of minutes. Then again, we go through that hierarchy. Water filtration is gone. Food distribution is gone. Um, you can wave a HTM cards to your blue in the face at uh, gas station. <laughs> I'll be shrugging their shoulders. There's nothing I can do. Uh, cars. Now, some people say, you know, I love that some, who are these people, the some people? But, I've, I've seen where upwards of 80 or 90 percent of cars that are exposed to direct uh, burst will short. Let's say it's only 10 percent. OK. OK. Where do you live? Uh, Alberta, Canada, on the prairies. Oh, you're out in the prairie. Are you in the city? Uh, no, I'm in the uh, rural, quite a ways out. OK. Uh, what's downtown Alberta like at five in the afternoon? <laughs> pretty crowded. Edmonton, Alberta, and Calgary. Yeah, you wouldn't want to get out of there. Uh, suppose 10% of the cars fail. What happens to the rest of them? <laughs> They're gridlocked. That's it. Just like that. Until the gas runs out. Wow. Yep. And I'm sure the interstates wouldn't be much better. I mean, you might be able to get around them to an extent, but it's only going to be for so long, it, right? It would quickly gridlock. Sure. So other than that, 
Are you having a nice, friendly day? <laughs> but this is exactly why I brought you on here, sir. Uh, absolutely. This is what I we, yeah, I'd love to hear about. Do, I going off script a little bit. Have you done any personal preparations? I know like what what can one person do when we're totally contingent on a grid, right? Now, to use my Peter Laurie voice, I, I have a basement that I can lock and I got everything inside of it. And the rest of you can go to hell. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Peter Laurie. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared. Good, good. Were, I, I didn't, I was going to ask this. Were you a prepper before you get into this? Or nope. do you even consider yourself one now? Nope. Uh, nope. Well, I didn't then. Yes. Until I started going, oh my God. This is real. Uh, let, let, let me point out something here for some of your listeners who might not be or just starting. It doesn't take much to be a prepper. Hmm. Next time you go to the market, pick up some canned food. I mean, there's always canned food for sale someplace. Dried soups, things like that. Get uh, If you're worried about your water supply, yeah, get a couple of cases of water in. But really important buy a water filter system. You can get a cheap one for 20 bucks or a more sophisticated one for 60 to $80. That can turn water into good water, potable water. Um, third, food. And then of course, personal security. Mm -hmm. I, I make it a point, I never discuss, oh, you got to get this gun, that gun. I, I don't like that. What I do say is if you're going to be armed, even if you're well trained, get refresher courses, or if you're going out for the first time, get trained. Hmm. You know, what's about one of the most dangerous people in the world? In fact, I have the line in the gun I, in the story. What what's the most dangerous person in the world? I just read it too. It, it uh, oh, it was a was it a woman with a gun who he was, was there, he was saying to his daughter. Yep, he had to leave the house, so he's telling his daughter, "You're going to have to have a shotgun." And what does he say to her? The most dangerous person in the world is somebody who has a gun and is not willing to use it. Right. But second, the most dangerous person in the world is a person who has a gun, doesn't know how to use it. Or third says, it's not loaded. Look. <laughs> you know. That, yes. There are a couple thousand people die each year from supposed not loaded guns. Wow. I I don't know. I that. Yeah. Dad always brought me up. Always treat it like it's loaded until you know it's not. And then if it ever leaves your control, check it again. <laughs> but yes. You know, I can only recall one time as a child when my father hit me. And I was down in the basement. I had a BB gun range. And he came downstairs and he said, how's it going? And I turned and I crossed the gun across my father. Yep. And my father stared at, I was 10 or 11. My father stared at me and he says, put the weapon on the ground now. And he slapped me. Now, he, 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 he didn't clobber me. He slapped me. I'm in tears. But then he's explaining to me, he said, during the war, I had a couple of buddies who were killed because the guy said, hey, Sarge, my gun is in boom. You know? Right. Just fooling um, around. You know, it's been 60 years since he did that to me, and I still remember that lesson. You know, you, you check, you double check, you don't become an Alex Baldwin. You check and double check and triple check to make sure you're safe. Every single time. So you mentioned a bit about solar as well. So for those oh. out there, yeah, <laughs> because I read 48 hours, and if people think your work is bleak, which I don't necessarily think, I would definitely put 48 hours in the same category as uh, Cormac's The Road. So, <laughs> but what, what's the difference? Can you share a little? Yeah. Um, if you were depressed before, let's make it worse. <laughs> yep. okay. It's okay. Uh, 48 hours, but no, not, not. Okay. The other key thing we have to worry about in life is called the CME. See, um, no, yeah. Coronal mass ejection. The sun all the time is putting out large electromagnetic disturbances. Uh, a couple of them passed within a day or two of Earth within the last week. Let me explain it this way. Picture the sun at the 50-yard line. 
So guy's holding up a ball that's the sun. There's another guy down at the goalpost, and he's holding up a little marble, and that's the earth. Once a day, blindfolded, the guy loses the sun, fires off a round. What's the probability he's going to hit him? Pretty rare. Pretty, pretty negligible. But if he did that every day for 150 years, what's the probability? It's getting a lot higher. That's what a solar mass ejection is. That every 100, 150 years, we get clobbered head on by a large CME, which will basically do the same thing to us that uh, an EMP would do. Except this one could actually be global in its proportions. Reading through, you mentioned... Of course, it piqued my interest because it said Canada. There was a throwaway line said something along the lines of, oh, a few years ago it happened in Canada. So, of course, I went on Wikipedia to find out. and sounded that it was something in Quebec in 1989. Yeah. Uh, I think it was 97. I think, oh. I think it was 97. Sure. Uh, the closer you are to the pole, the more intense the CME can be. So Quebec was far, far enough north that it actually disrupted their power system for a couple of days. A larger CME, like the infamous uh, Carrington event from 1859, uh, could affect almost the entire world. And it disrupts the electrical power and shuts us down. Same thing. Wow. And, yeah, in da like irreparable damage at that point. Yes. Yeah. Unless... CME might not be so bad if we have at least a day's warning because it travels at about a million miles per hour. Uh, so we would have 20, 30, 60 hours warning time. You got to pull every plug everywhere, get the wires as short as possible. The longer the wire, the more, the greater the probability that it's going to be impacted. All right. Okay. Uh, but even then, we're, we're just not prepared for it. How much worse do you think? Like that. I, I said something like an eight or 10 hour power outage they had. How much worse do you think it would be at this point? Uh, Carrington event will be very, very bad. That's unreal. I, I learned a lot about the Carrington event from 48 hours. I, yeah. I'd only heard it in passing before, but it was a, uh, cause it affected basically telegraph and tele um, telegraph lines and that sort of thing. 1859. It basically blew out the Victorian internet. <laughs> no, it did. It yeah. Was, yeah. The Victorian internet, well, well, it's an actual internet. Uh, it was the, you know, it was instantaneous communication around the world. And Carrington event um, shorted out telegraphy systems, was so intense that the wooden cross ties on railroads were bursting into flame because of the current running through railroad track. So if... If we stockpiled transformers and that sort of thing, and they're sitting in a yard unconnected, do you think they're safe there if something... Yeah, they'd have to be stored properly, but yeah, they could be safe. Um, you see, the greater the probability that something will work, the greater the probability the bad guys will think about it. Right. Whack-a-mole. The less the probability the less they might think about it. If we're sufficiently hard and it's sufficiently secure, they might not be willing to risk it because hmm. they're thinking, no, it's just not going to have the effect. So if you're, if you're standing there naked, probability a bad guy's going to get you is, is there. You know, um, The better prepared you are, the less the probability. What do you think? So... Harden the main transmission lines would be a good start, would it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I call them lifelines of recovery. You don't have to re restore every line, but say for me here in North Carolina, uh, the power generating systems down by Charlotte, you know, reinforce, run a line from here up to where I live in a small village about 100 miles away, but actually the town of Asheville is nearby about a quarter of a million people, make sure that line is secure. That way, at least, there's a hornet. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> if I'm looking like this, it's not because I'm crazy. It's like there's a hornet. Um, that at least some of the lines will be secure and keep communication going. That would be a big factor. And then it would at least give you a, uh, an infrastructure to rebuild off of, I right, suppose. Right, exactly. 
So do you ever get called de depressing or pessimistic or because the reason I ask, I, I didn't find, I mean, one second after is dark, but when you read all three, especially there is definitely glimmers of hope there. And I found a quote from you the other day and I really enjoyed it. And I thought I'd ask you because it said the, your, I believe it was about your space elevator book, which I thought was really cool. I've read into that concept a bit and it said, the big reason I wrote this book is I want to try to sell the idea that the best days of America are ahead of us. Do you still believe that? I know it's hard right this minute. I know. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I, I am an eternal optimist in terms of what we're capable of. Yes. You know, there, there was an interesting report I read recently that the current generation of Americans just don't have it anymore. I mean, they're adult. Uh, they're more interested in sex and rock and roll than taking mistake. They're ignorant of what our society is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And against the fanatical preparedness of some countries, we're in a world of hurt. I always then like to point out that article was written in 1940. <laughs> And don't tell that to the bomber pilots who were over Berlin in 1944. Wow. They weren't adult. They were putting their lives on the line because they believed in America. Now, they weren't dying at that point because, oh, I love America. Kaboom. They were there because their comrades were there, their best friends, and they had been raised with a sense of responsibility. You stand with your friends and you do it. And again, I mentioned the vets. I, I'm a, a somewhat humorous story. Sure. I had a classroom full of vets and, and some of my students, and I showed them a film uh, made during the war about America's preparing itself to go. And actually, in the movie, said, go forth to save the world. And America responded. So it's showing, you know, the ships going out, the tanks, the marching men and everything else and, and rousing music. And it got done. And I looked at my students and I said, how does that make you feel? You know, imagine it's 1940. And, the, and one of my kids said, you know, it makes me want to go out and kick somebody's ass. <laughs> and a, a veteran in the back growled, we did, kid. We did kick their blanking asses. And with that, all the veterans are like, we did it. You know, we stood up. Yeah, we were scared crapless. We didn't want to be there, but when the time came, we were there. I still believe that's possible. I hope it never happens again. But I think there's a resilient core in America and in Canada and elsewhere. But people are still willing to stand up for the right thing. I love it. Do you have time? I, I told you I'd keep it to 60 minutes for you. Do you have time for a few quick, uh, quick fire questions? If you give me a three minute break, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Well, I'll otherwise, I'm going to be squirming. <laughs> I understand. I get the same way. You go ahead and I'll, I'll sit here and I can talk. Yes. Let, let, let's do 15 minutes, okay? Okay. 10 or 15 minutes and then I got to run, okay? Okay, that's perfect. Yes. Okay. Hang yeah. on. I'll be right back. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You go right ahead. Thank. I appreciate you giving a few extra minutes there. Come on, dog. <laughs> I'm going to put you outside. So we will just... There. So we'll give him a minute there, guys. I This has been, wow, some of those stories have given me chills so far. I am just absolutely blown away. And I am going to start a timer for 15 minutes so that I do not keep him one minute longer than I promised. This is an absolute, this is great. I, I don't even know. I don't know how to explain it, how much, how enjoyable this interview has been so far. So if you guys have questions, I've got a couple here stored, starred already. So if you guys want to start throwing them up, I've got five or six here. Chris Dixon sent me one earlier. Uh, I hope for those of you listening on the audio that you enjoy this as much as we did seeing uh, Mr. Forston live here because this has been absolutely great. I uh, just definitely enjoyed it. I'm glad he agreed to be on here. Um, he I'm was back. Yeah, no problem at all, sir. I'm smiling and my coffee cup still has enough coffee in it. Perfect. Oh. How you doing? There we are. Perfect. Hey. 
All right. So I will give you, I got a couple here of mine. I've got a few from the audience and I had okay. a couple sent to me. Um, well, the first one I already asked you was about Washington being based on a real person. So we'll skip that one. Um, this is one of my own, I don't know. Uh, oh, I'm starting my 15 minute timer. There we go. Okay. okay. So um, any reason they switched the reader from book one to book two and three, the, the audio book reader, any idea behind that? I was just curious. No. No. Okay. I, I have no um, control over that. No, that's okay. I just, the second and third, I was listening. I said, like, he sounds different. And then I Googled him and he was yeah, Belky. On, yeah, Belky from Perfect Strangers, if you remember that show. I don't know if you do, but anyway, that's okay. You know, um, fact, I've never listened to it. Oh, that's okay. I'm a I'm a staunch yeah. audiobook reader. Just but, I have to um, no, uh, audiobooks has been very, very good to me. I so, can imagine. They, yeah, people yeah, in the prepper so field are long. doers. And they, they tend to need to have the time, you know, get a lot of earphone time. But um, yeah. I read at one point it was up one second after it was optioned by Warner Brothers. Is that still a thing? Not Warner Brothers. Oh. Um, I went through option hell for years. Ran afoul of a German company that I, whenever I mention them, I start getting Tourette moments. Fair enough. You know how they wanted to open the movie? Oh, I don't even, do I want to know? That a 747 crashes in the middle of Black Mountain and John rescues a maiden from the wrecked plane who's Michaela. And that's, that was oh. cool. uh, yeah, yeah, I almost lost it. But no, I've got a great company now. Uh, in fact, I was informed just yesterday that we're going for multiple scripts and we're still having a problem selling things. Uh, meaning to the distribution system, be it Netflix or Hulu or whatever. But I'm optimistic that before the end of the year, we, we'll, we'll definitely have a green light. So It'll series or movie? There'll be a TV series. Yes. All right. <laughs> no, <laughs> Good. Movies are dead. Yes, absolutely they are. Yeah. Yes. that's Unless, awesome. unless you're a Marvel superhero with Marvel 15 or whatever, movies are dead. It's television series that are doing streaming. Do you ever pick an author or uh, sorry, an actor in your head for the, the protagonist? You know, when I first wrote the book, I thought Denzel Washington would be the perfect protagonist. Oh, wow. And I, I was ready to change his that. I actually was saying I will change the ethnicity on the spot if we could get Denzel Washington. Um, I don't know now who I would choose. Um, he's all tied up, but a couple years back. The guy who plays Harry Bosch. Oh, yeah. Um, he's a... Titus Welver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He would... Yes. He was, he was going... Model. Really? Yeah. I taught him for three years. That's cool. He was a wise ass then, and he's a wise ass now. <laughs> and I still... You know, I, I don't know. I guess we'll be new people. Okay. You know? Sometimes that that's best, you know. Are you, uh, I, I know the answer to this, but I need to ask you anyway, a dog person? Because, man, okay, you broke my that. heart. <laughs> okay. Come here. Come here a second. Give me a kiss. Aww. Yeah, I'm very much Aww. a dog person. When I wrote the book, um, I had two golden retrievers. They're both gone now. Uh, hang on just a second. Sure. Let's get her on. Come here. You don't want it. You're not going to get it. Um, <laughs> they never cooperate. Yeah, so um, very much a dog, and there, there she is. Aww. No, she. I, I have a golden doodle now, and she's just such a sweetheart. Uh, yeah, I'm very much a dog person. I remember when I wrote that. Uh, first, my well, first dog died. Killed. Aww. I was in tears. And I actually sent it to Newt, and Newt comes back. He said, "You got up. This is horrible. What you did, you know." No. But think, what do I do with my dog? Right. If there's a crisis, and pounds of extra dog food stashed away to keep. Oh, we might have lost you just a little bit there. Oh, there we go. Oh, there she. Oh, there she is. Hello. What about? No, we're okay. Just got a little bit hairy there for a minute. Maybe it's a CME or uh, some solar interference. 
what, what about um so I'll say that yeah I know I should sorry knock them knock them with um you didn't I've always been an art bell fan did, you did an interview with art bell years ago do you remember it at all uh oh yes yeah you know in how fact, was that was one less interviews art ever did really that was where somebody fired some shots while we were on the air yes I didn't know that. I heard about Mark that. Mark and I are on the air, and there's shots in the back. Wow. I was the person he was interviewing. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, that. Yeah. And, yeah, Art passed away, was about a year ago. Uh, George Nori, who does Coast to Coast, and I, we've been good friends for years. Uh, I do a program with him about every three months. I didn't. Thank and you. Yeah. He's a... He's He's a hell of a good guy. I really like George a lot. I don't know. I yeah, I enjoy. I, I modeled my show opening after Art Bell's intro. I always enjoy him. I, yeah, and it just I didn't. I don't do it live while I have a guest, of course. But you know, I yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's cool. I just it was a you know six degrees of separation. I had to ask you about. So well, uh, something about art. We were being interviewed live. Shots are fired. He tells me you got to hold. So I'm hold for about 20 minutes. Police arrive. He's back on the air, but we, we, we haven't gone live yet again. I'm like, are you okay? What the hell is going on? And he said, well, well the show must go on. Wow. And he did the rest of the interview. That's awesome. He, he was a gutsy guy. I really liked him. He, I, what I appreciate about him the most was the fact that he never treated anybody like an idiot. He always let them. I mean, okay. There were times, but he always let, no matter how maybe kooky the guest was, he give them their time and he, you know, he just asked them questions like a sensible human being. I like that. George Norrie, same way, uh, coast to coast. Let's face it, George and I have talked in private and he said the same thing. 75% of his guests are wearing tinfoil hats, you know? There's some really strong, I remember one called in with when I was being interviewed and he said, you live near uh, Grandfather Mountain. I was like, yeah. He said, you know, there's a tunnel there that if you go down that tunnel, you come out the other side at the secret base uh, outside of Denver, Colorado. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> oh, boy. But uh, about a quarter of his shows are, you know, for me, okay, I'm serious. Yep. It's serious hard science be it that or aliens throw my belly button and i can hear them singing uh handles whatever out of my left tooth <laughs> he treats them the same he does i i appreciated that about him i really did uh question from uh, chris dixon here in alberta he wanted to know where your inspiration for the darkness came in one second after he says it's realistic but it's a very dark read that was his feeling because that's the way it is. That's what I figured you would say. That you're an optimistic realist, aren't you? <laughs> that that's the way it would be. And you notice in my own forward, I said, I hope 30 years from now, I'm just viewed as a crank. It never happened. Because that means my daughter grew up safe. Pester hmm. uh, and a fly again. Hunter wants to know any idea how uh big dot gov how 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 big gov how how hardened they are or not hardened let's not get into conspiracy theory but i remember several years back talking with a woman who was very close friends with a senator and her comment was don't worry they're taken care of of course they are anyway it's another story for another day <laughs> but yeah it makes sense yeah. Um, Nate would like to know, uh, and we'll, we'll end with this question here. Uh, he's, are there any resources for the Carrington event? I can't find any firsthand account or information pre 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, have them look up a book called the sun Kings S U N Kings. Okay. It's about solar astronomers in the 19th century. Very good account there. I knew nothing about the Carrington event until one second after it came out. And a friend recommended to me, I just read a book called The Sun Kings. 
and it's just come out. And I read the book. I said, holy crap, this, this is scary stuff. So I think that's one of the good prime. Well, it's not primary, of course, because it's drawing on articles of the time. But I believe the London Illustrated News at that time had an article about it. Okay. So uh, they were seeing the aurora as far south as the Virgin Islands. Wow. Yeah. I will leave it with that for him. And okay. what do you have? Do you have anything that you would like to, what do you have coming out? Anything anytime soon? I know you're probably beyond shameless plugging, but I'm I always. chain smoking, all right? <laughs> yeah. What do you, can you give us an insight on what you're working on or no? Uh, yeah. One second after four. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask you just because I have to, do you have an ETA on that? Even kind of somewhere in the ether? Let's say I had a nice conversation with my publisher yesterday and he gave me another extension. Okay. That's all I needed. All right. Well, I'm going to, if, if you want to hang for just one sec, I'm going to end well, the show. We'll hang for another minute or two. Let's go. Perfect. Okay. Do you have um, any more questions? I had a couple more there, and I just cleared them out. I have to apologize. <laughs> oh, no. Because I, I do have to get on the road by about 2.30. So. Okay. No problem. So in the story, <clears throat> I can't remember if this term was actually there or not. Maybe it was. But you 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 referred to the, the EMP as being the great leveler. Or, you know, even, I hate to say this, but somebody in a cave overseas somewhere could get a hold of one and compete with the world's greatest armies what do you th yeah still feel obviously you still feel that way but yes um i was out at uh omaha nebraska it's been 10 years now and they had me in to talk to some very kind of high level people and that's I'm not the one to sound mysterious. Oh yes, uh, I also saw Area. I also saw Area 51 when I was out there. And guess what? And then the screen goes dark. All right. Sure. Uh, and the scenario I was hearing was pack two or three Scud rockets onto a container ship. That's enough. Park it out in the Gulf of Mexico, where we have almost we have no defenses really along the Gulf. We do have defenses up along the, the Alaskan coast in the northwest United States, pop them up, if need be, shout Allah Akbar and blow up the, the transport ship after that, and you've done it. Wow. So I could see an Iranian-based terrorist group uh, taking the handoff on the weapons and doing it. I definitely could see North Korea as definitely a player. Yeah, it's out there. How about Hamid? I love that story about Hamid, uh, the, the store owner, when uh, 9-11. So the whole time I'm reading, especially one second after, did, okay, did you start writing this pre-9-11 or post-9-11? Oh, post-9-11. I, I assumed as much. I just wanted to make sure that Genesis didn't go back further. But I love the story of Hamid because it reminded me of certain times when the whole town put the banner up and welcomed him home when... Um, That's the much... story. Oh, can you share? Sure. Uh, Hamid ran a convenience store in the center of town. And he had just purchased it. And a lousy competitor here in this area who wanted to buy the store denounced Hamid the day after 9-11, saying that he was cheering the attack on and everything. And the FBI came and they took him away. This was like... <sighs> And the whole town went up in arms over this, including our congressman, saying this is discrimination, this is terrible, he's a good guy. And when he finally got released, uh, there was a party. And I remember the next day in that from that store, he had taken like some butcher paper and hand wrote a sign, I I'm proud to be an American. Thank you, Black Mountain. That give me chills. I'm, I was out mowing the day I first listened to it. Yeah. And I remember right where I was because that just, I almost had to stop and cry for a minute. It was so it, good. It was real. Uh, he was a good friend. And so I deliberately used him uh, in the opening where 
John goes in, gets a couple of cartons of cigarettes, maybe not quite telling the truth, but then says, do, do yourself a favor, my friend. Take all your cigarettes off the shelf now because they're worth too much. As you can see, I've been fighting this problem for years. <laughs> that So that inspired a show topic I'm going to do coming up. The, the the currency of the apocalypse. It seems like one of yours was definitely cigarettes, and that seems to be one in all of the all of the books that I've read. It's kind of a common trope. Um, gasoline too, I think. Uh, maybe moonshine or liquor. Anything else that you think will be a real high value trading target? Twenty two caliber bullets. Fair enough. Um, I, I, and I, I've talked to preppers and everything else, and they're like, yeah. Uh, Ammunition is going to run out pretty quick. And, you know, we have this fantasy. Because I grew up in, just outside New York City. And there was a fantasy. Oh, once you got out in the countryside, there'd be all this food that you can harvest, deer and everything else. <laughs> no. Uh, have you ever been in the woods on the first day of hunting season? <laughs> Hunters everywhere. It's scary. Yes, it is. Can you imagine there's no hunting season? So people are going out, they're killing anything and everything. Within a couple of weeks, all your ammunition has been depleted. Thank God. Right. And uh, things like 22 caliber bullets. I see 22 caliber bullets. I tell people get fractional silver. Oh. Get it by quarters. Uh, just get a couple of rolls of silver quarters, silver half dollars. Yes. Uh, my daughters uh, get out a Dodge bag and mine. <clears throat> I have a couple of silver dollars in them and some other fractional currency. Because let's let's just say it's temporary, but things are going crazy. And, the, you know, the guy at the local gas station is saying, I'm not taking credit cards. or Yeah, $100, $100 bill, not worth much, but I'll give you five gallons. And, I, you know, somebody pulls out a couple of genuine silver dollars and said, look, you want to negotiate? Uh, when Sandy hit New York City, it was amazing how within a day or two, people were storming the Burger Kings and McDonald's trying to buy burgers with $100 bills. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, gasoline, of course. Uh, fractional silver. What was the other one you had? Uh, moonshine? Yeah, I think you talked moonshine. about that a little bit, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, and, but that's going to become an issue. One, are we going to have use this uh, corn as food or liquor? Right. Yeah. Were Were you Are you much of a TV watcher at all? A I, little bit. Did you ever I'm, watch? I'm an old TV watcher. Do you remember Jericho? The show's going on 15 to. I hate it. You hated it. I okay. Can you share why it was always because a I was very close to a television deal, and then Jericho came along. Oh, we got an EMP story. Okay, that makes and then, sense. You know, I watched a couple, and then what, what really got me was they find the cornucopia. I think it was the fourth or fifth, a whole train load of food. Yep, they sure this did. So happened to be stalled there. I don't think so. Liter literary license. Hey, I always. I read these books and I'm like, why are things so convenient? Well, because we're following the protagonist that's already made it. To, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I, I yeah. get it. But no, that's cool. I wondered about that. It was always a bit of a favorite. And it came out pretty close to when your book came out, yeah, didn't it? it came out yeah. It's around the time my book came out. And I read, so you did your doctoral dissertation on an African-American. I don't, uh, what was I, I, United States color troops. Thank you. Yes. And then you turned it into a work of fiction or a, a work of historical fiction. How, yeah. how did that process go? I often wonder what writing historical fiction is like. Oh, gosh. Uh, I originally started because a friend was extolling me to do a young adults novel on the Civil War. She was a professor. OK. I started it. It wasn't going anywhere. And then suddenly I realized there was no primary documents on this regiment. In fact, there was no primary documents anywhere to speak of of the entire USCT, United States Colored Troops experience. And that became my dissertation. I spent two years studying the 28th United States Colored Troops who were from Indiana. Large number of them were wiped out at the Battle of the Crater. And it was an incredible research experience. I loved it. And then I've written two books on it since. 
Uh, we look like men of war and then the crater. Ever have any interest in having those um, optioned at all? From your lips to God's ear. Cool. Uh, and, that's up to them, not me. No, fair enough. And what about, I, I, I can't remember if this was in one second after if I read it researching, but you'd mentioned the, the largest non-nuclear explosion in, was that during the Civil War? Did, was that? Oh, uh, peace shooter compared to what we during the, the largest explosion during the Civil War was four tons of powder. Okay. Packed under a Confederate fort at the Battle of the Crater. Uh, maybe the largest non nuclear explosion. There was an ammunition ship that blew up. Is it the Halifax war. explosion? Uh, the Halifax explosion might very well be the biggest one. And then this explosion in Beirut. Uh, about a year or two ago, right, where it was just obliterated everything for like half a mile. So uh, the Civil War one's a pea shooter in comparison. That uh, that explosion in Beirut reminded me of a last Babylon. Yes. When yeah, that uh, right because it happened in the same place. I thought I was pretty sure it did. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other either movies or books that were either inspiration or things that you always love to go back and read again? What are you growling at? Oh, he's telling me. <laughs> uh, I don't I think maybe her playmate's coming over. Okay, That's okay. stop it. Stop it. Um, I love my Lost Regiment series. Okay. That That's a lot of fun, about a Civil War regiment that has to survive on another world. Uh, I've done eight books in that series, and just, I would love to see that as a television series. It's been optioned a couple of times. I would love that. That would be really neat. What... Do you enjoy Ken Burns' Civil War series? Sun rises and sets on that. I use that as uh, one of my Civil War class. I'm a baseball fan, so that's how I got introduced to Ken Burns. Mm -hmm. And I, I love his style. I know, you know, mostly pictures with voiceover, but I could listen to him talk. He could read a phone book and I would be enjoyed. Exactly. Uh, uh, McCullough, who just died about two weeks ago, he was the major narrator for the Ken Burns series. Really? Yeah, him and Shelby Foote were the two major narrators. Right. And then McCullough did the American Experience for 10 or 11 years. Fabulous historian. Absolutely a great historian. Lamented that he passed about two weeks past. Wow. Well, I. how do you feel? Is that a good spot to end it right there? Yeah, we might have to because I got to go out, run errands and everything else, pick up medication. Play that is dog. okay. I just yeah. want to say thank you first. Oh, and I'll just for a second here. Let's see. Sure. Wait, where? There she is. Oh, hi, beautiful. sweetheart. <laughs> that is so, so we'll sweet. We'll leave her as the talking head, okay? <laughs> well, 